Man, we do the weirdest stuff when we're home, home alone. If you haven't already done that, uh, I know that you know that you've done some of those. If you haven't done it yet, you're going to probably do it in the next couple of weeks. You might even do it with other people in the house. You might, you might get caught. In fact, if you have done one of these uh, and you are online and you're in the chat, why don't you comment on a thumbs up or thumbs down? Don't tell us what you did, but why don't you participate uh, uh, that way? Now, that's some stuff that you might do alone. Uh, there are things that we do together, though. And one of those things that we do together, uh, that I don't know if you've ever got the chance to do this, uh, but is an escape room. Have you ever been to an escape room? I love uh, escape rooms. I've only been a couple of times, but I went, I actually got to take my boys and a bunch of their friends to one here in uh, Beaverton, and I'm telling you, it was a blast. If you don't know what an escape room is, an escape room is really a game that you get to play with a group of people. You go into this locked room, you have a time limit, uh, and that you have got to get all of the clues accomplished and get the keys so that you can get out of the room before something happens. And the one that we went to, there was uh, a bomb was going to explode if we didn't get out on time. And so we had to go through, and you've got to solve all of these different puzzles and clues in order to get the next clues unlocked. And, and if you get all the way through to the end, you unlock the door and you get out uh, safe. And they are a lot of fun. They are a lot of fun. The nice thing is, is that they are, you're not locked in there. It's not real. And, you know, our room didn't explode in the end. We, but we had a, a great time. It was a great time for all of us. Now, this idea of escape rooms, I think, is really uh, valuable, really important. And I want to use it uh, to understand a little bit about God and how he interacts with us. So if you are, uh, if you've got a, uh, some notes with you, if you've got your phone or maybe you just grab a piece of paper, I want you to grab that in front of you and I want you to think about this idea of an escape room, okay? I want you to think of the, what kind of escape room are you in right now? What kind of escape room are you in right now? Now, it might be a negative thing. It might be a relationship with somebody at work where you're like, they just drive you crazy, and if you could get onto a different team, that would be fantastic. Maybe it's a relationship thing going on at home that you're wrestling with. Maybe it is a, a, a work-life balance uh, trap that you feel like you're in right now. Maybe it's a spiritual hurdle that you're trying to get across where you're going, I kind of, I'm, I'm checking out this church thing. I'm not quite sure. I, you know, I've had bad church experiences in the past or I've been hurt by the church or I've been hurt by weirdo Christians that are in the church. Maybe that's the box that you're in right now. And you're like, I believe in God. I'm not sure about this whole Jesus thing. And I feel like I'm kind of stuck in this box. Maybe that's what you're dealing with. Maybe you're dealing with a health issue. Maybe that's the escape room that you feel like you're trapped in. Or maybe it's a positive thing in your life. Maybe you are, you're looking for your next challenge and you just, you're, you're like, I don't know what's next. I feel like I'm stuck in where I am right now. Or maybe you are, are trying to take a next step in your spiritual journey and you're trying to, to go farther than you have before, but you're not sure what to do next. Or maybe you are in one of those spots where you've, things are going well and you've actually got multiple good options and you're sitting here stressed out about which one do I pick? I can only pick one. Which one do I pick? What if I pick the wrong one? And you're thinking about, you're thinking, I, I don't know what to, to do next. They're great options. But maybe you have got, in fact, I'm pretty sure that you have an escape room that you feel like you're in. And some, and maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, but I want you to write it down. I want you to write down what escape room you're dealing with right now. Now, we deal with these escape rooms in a really interesting way. If, if they are painful or if they're a, a problem, we kind of have this, these default responses that we go to. Some of us go, I'm just going to figure it out. I'm going to go on my own and I'm, I'm, I'm going to figure it out. I'll come back once I've got it figured out. Some of us really, we're, we're like a hurt puppy. Have you ever seen a puppy get hurt and they retreat off into a corner and they hide somewhere? Maybe that's your uh, default response. Maybe you get overwhelmed and you feel absolutely paralyzed by the problem that you're dealing with and you don't know what to do and so you do, you do nothing. Maybe you panic. Maybe you freak out and you just panic. Maybe you're one of those people that when you come into a situation like this, you go, I've got to figure out a plan. So I'm going to write down a plan that is going to be awesome and then I'm going to come up with a backup plan and a backup plan to that and a backup plan to that. However you, de you default to, whatever you default to, whatever response you find that you go to, I want you to write that down too. So you've got, you've got the escape room that you're in, and what's, what's your default? 
Maybe you think about the other experiences that you have, and you go, you know what? I usually do just go figure it out on my own, or I do usually panic. I can tell you what mine is. I panic. I panic. In fact, I panic every Monday. When I sit down on Monday, I've got a number of things going on, right? I, I, my job is to work here at the church full time, and so there is a lot going on. There's always a list of things that are happening uh, that I've got to make sure that are happening each week. I also just had the opportunity recently to join a, a ministry consulting group. And, and so I'm, I'm jumping into that, and there's, there's some new things that I've got to learn there. And I, I've got to make sure that I don't fall behind on any of my, my onboarding. I also uh, run a small coaching gr- uh, company that, that I've got to make sure that I connect with those clients and that, that they're getting cared for. And then I've got family stuff, right? I've got my my marriage that I'm making sure that I invest in. I've got my kids who have got appointments to go to and sports to go to. And there's always feels like there's a lot going on. And so on a Monday, I will sit down. I work on a Monday. First thing I do is I'll sit down and make this list of everything that I've got to do that week. And, uh, and it, it's, it feels overwhelming. I look at that list, and I tell you it happens almost like clockwork every Monday, but I will look at that list and, and, and start, my chest will start to tighten up, my, you know, I'll start to sweat a little bit, I'll just start freaking out, because I'm like, there is no possible way that any human being can get this all done in one week. And then, it's like clockwork, about an hour in, I start to figure out a plan. And this happens every week, and it's not like when I start freaking out, it's not like I can convince myself that I'm going to have a plan and it's going to be okay. I freak out, I panic, and then I have a plan. And that is my default response, my absolute default response. So write down what is your default response. What is your default response to when you're in that escape room? Now, let me throw a little, uh, a little curveball at you. What if that thing that you're dealing with is spiritual? Because if it's spiritual, I think it's funny that our tendency is to think that our spiritual journey is both uh, personal and private, right? And we feel like on our own, uh, you know, if it's a spiritual thing, we got to figure that out. It's personal. No, but it's nobody else's business. My business, you know, their business isn't my business. It's funny that we kind of change how we react when it, when it becomes spiritual. But we do have this default response, Right? We do have this default response. And hopefully for you, it isn't isolation. But if it is isolation, then let's talk through that. Because here's what is true about both you and me, about all of us, is that we were not made for isolation. It might be appropriate at times for us to go and, and find some time alone. I know that it's, I need to do that. Every once, my Mondays are not, nobody else is around while I'm panicking, right? That's a time with me. But we not, we're not made for isolation. We are made for family. We are absolutely made for family. So I want to look a little bit about what the Bible has to say, what Scripture has to say about this idea that we were made for family. So if you're following along uh, in the notes, uh, we're going to do we're going to look at uh, 1 John three uh, verse one. And if you've got a Bible app, you can take a look at that. If you've got your Bible with you, open that up. But 1 John three one it says, "See how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that's what we are." Now, Pastor Gabe talked about this a little last week, and I think it's so important for us to understand is that we are a part of God's family. Now, when you read that, I think it's important to ask this question, is this verse about me? Because not everything that you read in Scripture is necessarily being written straight to you. When you think about the Bible, there is a, a, you might he- have heard it be called the Old Testament and the New Testament. I like to think of the Old Testament as being the Hebrew Bible because it really is documenting the interaction between God and the Hebrews as they went on this, this journey over generations with them. And sometimes you will read something in there that is a covenant between God and his people And he is saying, or God and and some specific person in Scripture, and he will say it directly to them. And so sometimes you would read something, you'd be like, hmm, who's who's he saying that to? Is he saying that to me? Well, if you read the context, if you back up and read the paragraph before uh, or after, you might be able to begin to understand who it was speaking to. But this question, this 1 John, this is in the New Testament. This is after Jesus was here on earth. And the question is, is that, when this verse says that 
that we are his children, is that about us? Is that about you and me? Well, if you're watching this, I can tell you this. Those people who have said yes to Jesus is who this is talking about. If you're not quite there yet, that's okay. I'm going to give you an opportunity later in the service to take that step in your journey. But if you said yes to Jesus, if you said, Jesus, you are my leader, you're my forgiver, you're my salvation, uh, then, then you are who this is talking about. You are the child of God. You are a part of his family. And the great thing is, is that if you are a part of his family, Jesus did this while, uh, while he was on earth and he instructs us to do it too, is that he tells us to go public with that decision. And he does it by being baptized. And he tells us to baptize one another. Because what baptism does is it says that it announces that I am not ashamed to be a part of the family of God. That I am not ashamed. I want everyone to know. And there is so much symbolism in this idea of baptism. Because when we are baptized, it is declaring our faith. It is telling the world that even if I I became a follower of Christ, and I did that in my own head, and I was sitting in a room by myself, or I was sitting in a room full of people, or if you did it, you're doing it today, that 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 is a decision that was happening uh, in you. But baptism is this declaration, this announcement that I have, I am a part of God's family. And it does this thing where we, when we go under the water, we share this imagery with Jesus of dying as we go under the water. And when we come back out, rising from the dead again, it symbolizes his resurrection. It symbolizes this death to our old life. And it announces the beginning of our new life. And it allows us to celebrate you joining the family of God and joining the family of Jesus. And if you've ever been to a baptism at Westside, uh, you know that we cheer and yell and clap, and we are so excited when you get baptized. That's why. You are announcing that you are are not ashamed to be a part of the family. And so we get to celebrate with you. So if you are reading that and you go, yeah, that's talking to me. Jesus is my leader. He is my forgiver. And you've taken this step of baptism, then we're part of God's family. So what do we do with that? If we're part of God's family, if we are children of his, then what do we do? So what I want to do is I want to look at uh, another passage that's in your notes. It's Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 12 through 20. Now, before I uh, read this verse, I want to tell you a little bit about who's writing it. Paul is writing it, and if you don't know who Paul is, uh, Jesus had his ministry, and Jesus Jesus really, he was a a, a rabbi, a teacher, and he reached primarily, for the most part, he reached people that had had a Jewish history. There were lots of other people in there, but that's that's the core group that he was initially reaching. And then this guy, Paul, after he died and rose from the dead, this guy, Paul, came along, and he was like the greatest missionary in the world, and he started to spread this good news. It's part of the reason why you and I can, can be here and are here talking about this is because of the work that Paul did. So Paul's writing this letter. Uh, and and he's, uh, let's jump into it, actually. Let's jump into verse 12. It says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. So you got to understand that, that Jesus had, had uh, ministered to these Jewish people, and they, there were Jewish Christians that Paul was writing to. But then there was everybody else, and he refers to everybody else as Gentiles. And so he's writing to them, and he says, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. This is how I think of this. Uh, when I was younger, I'm going to date myself in saying this, I owned a CD by a, a young girl called Katie Hudson. And it was a great CD. I loved listening to her. She was fantastic. Now, you probably don't know her by the name Katie Hudson, but you probably do know her by the name Katie Perry. Katie, now, you're a little late to the game because I knew Katy Perry when she was Katie Hudson, and so you're not as cool as I am. I've, I discovered her, and it's okay. You're a little late, but it's okay. Now, there's, I, I've, I've discovered a few artists. In fact, I don't know if you know a guy named Matt Kearney. If you've ever been to a, a Ducks game, 
Uh, they're, one of the songs that they sing every time I've been there uh, is this Matt Kearney song, and it's fantastic. And Matt Kearney's big time now, but I knew Matt Kearney when he wasn't big time. I got to go see him at this little dive bar outside of Detroit, Michigan. This, it was like the Pink Pig or something like that, but it was this little tiny bar that uh, we got to go in and watch Matt Kearney sing. Now, we could only be there for a couple of songs because my wife Lori was pregnant with our first child and it was filling with smoke and she was like, nope, we're out. But I at least got to listen to two songs of Matt Kearney before he became big time. So if you only listen to him now, again, you're kind of late to the game, right? You know how you get about those people who uh, just jump on the bandwagon with the Seahawks when it's going well and it's annoying? That's what this is kind of writing to, right? It's saying the Jewish Christians that were there had all of these kind of customs that they had brought with them, and as the Gentiles came into the mix, they, they, they felt like, you know, you're not, you haven't quite been with us the whole time. And Paul is writing to them, and he's saying, no, 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 Gentiles, you are no longer strangers. You're not foreigners here. You're all a part of the family. So let's keep going. It says, you are citizens along with all of God's holy people, everybody together. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. There is this house. It is a massive house. It's got thousands and thousands of rooms, millions of rooms. And all of our escape rooms are in this house together. And it is Jesus' house. And the coolest thing about that is that means that Jesus got keys to all of the escape rooms. It's his house. It's fantastic. So if we are members of that house, then what do we do? How do we respond? If you're following along your notes, there's six things that I want us to think about uh, when we are members of this house, when we are in this house, in this family. And the first one is, is that we are joined. You might hear people talk about us being the body of Christ or the, uh, that the church is a body. And we talk a lot about that concept when we are talking about spiritual gifts and what are our roles. And, and, and that's, that's great and that's, that is a, a one way to understand it. But there's another way to understand this idea of the body of Christ. And that's, that is that we are many parts, but we belong to each other. My wrist belongs to my arm, right? My arm belongs to my shoulder. We are a part of one body. We belong to each other. We are joined, right? We are joined as this family. We are joined together. And that means that, that we've got to think about each other in a way that, that respects that, that honors that, that we are joined together, that we belong to one another. So that's one. The second thing is, is that we welcome. If we are in this house, we welcome Maybe the first day of school uh, that you went to, you were freaking out going, what if nobody likes me? What if I don't know where to go? What if I don't know what's going on? And you, you, you had this fear of not feeling welcome. Maybe you're a parent and you just cried the whole first day that your kid went to school because you were freaking out. You were feeling all those feelings for them. But when we're in this family together, we we welcome. I told you that I joined uh, a, a ministry consulting group, and I remember the first couple of times that I was sitting in the room with this team of people, and I'm looking around uh, at the, the people that are there, and I'm like, oh, I've read that guy's book. Oh, I've read that guy's book. She worked at that church. Like, I was totally 100% intimidated. I was thinking, how in the world is this kid from northern Alberta, Canada, sitting in the room with these giants? This is un. This is, uh, I was totally intimidated, totally freaked out. Now, they didn't, they were awesome. None of them acted like that, but I was just in awe. And I was so nervous about sitting in that room and messing something up or saying something stupid. But there was this great, uh, this, a couple of guys actually, that came alongside me and, and started to give me clues, tell me what was happening next. That they would, if I got stuck or lost or something, they would they would point something out to me or I could lean over them and to say, hey, where are we? I'm kind of lost. And they welcomed me with open arms. With open arms. And when we're in that family together, we welcome one another, right? Jesus said that we're going to know that we are followers. They will know that we're followers of him in the way that we love each other, in the way that we welcome one another. 
And so if we're in this house together and we are welcoming one another, that means when somebody comes into this family and they're not sure what is going on or or what happens next, that we are welcoming them. We're walking with them. We're joining them in that, that journey. So if we are in this house, if we are in this family together, we are joined, we welcome. The third is, is that we are authentic. We are authentic. This is a, a value of West Side is that there's no perfect people allowed, that you don't get to have masks, uh, n- n- that, that we, we get to share who we actually are. We get to share what we're struggling with. We get to be honest with one another about what's going on in our lives. And on the other side of that, that we, we are honest with one another and that, that we can help support and, and coach and and, and guide one another. When you think about this idea of being in an escape room, it's like, tell me, let me tell you what it's not. It's not somebody standing on the edge of the escape room going, you're doing it wrong. You're, you're getting colder. You're getting warmer. Or it's not like somebody standing there and yelling, hey, you're doing it wrong. Hey, you're, you're being an idiot. Stop it. That's not, that's not being authentic. Not in a family, right? It means that we're standing there gently helping them figure out the puzzle that they're dealing with. Help to look at the clues and figure out what's what's next. So we are joined with one another. We welcome one another. We are authentic. And then the fourth one is that we deny pride. We deny pride. There's no Katie Hudson, Katy Perry thing going on. There's no looking at somebody else and saying, Oh, you go to a different church, you don't get it. There's no, you haven't been around here long enough. You haven't known Jesus as long as I've known him. We, we push that stuff aside. You might have someone in your, in your growth group or at work that you think, you know what, we would not be friends if we weren't forced to be in the same room together. But maybe if they are in the family of Jesus, that, that we've got to treat them like family. We've got to, to honor them. We have to excel at showing respect for each other. So we are joined, we welcome, we are authentic, we deny pride, and we maintain confidentiality. Right? You think about your closest friends. Your friends get honest with you when they feel like it's safe and when they feel like you're not going to go spread it around to the rest of the world. Right? Gossip is gross. Proverbs uh, 16, 28 says, a perverse person stirs up conflict and gossip separates close friends. You know that. If you've ever had a close friend go and spread something around about you that you shared with them just to get attention or, or for whatever reason, you know that that puts a wedge in your, in your relationship. That's true in the family of Jesus. That's true in, in, in his house. Is that we gotta, It's got to be a safe place. It's got to be a place where we can share what's going on and not think that everybody in the world's going to know about it. Of course, there are times if it's unsafe that we've got to make sure that we protect you, but confidentiality is so important for a family. So we are joined, we are welcomed, we are authentic, we deny pride, we maintain confidentiality, and the number six is that we maintain frequency. Relationships take time. They take time of repetitive being together. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not give up meeting together. Encourage one another. Right? As we go through this idea of social distancing and separating a little bit from the people around us, that doesn't mean mean that we don't have to maintain that frequency. We don't need to get on the phone and call each other and say, hey, how's it going? Or send a text or a a message to one another and say, hey, I was thinking about you. How, How are you feeling? We need to maintain that frequency. Can't let anything get in the way. I think about my uh, daughter. I've got a picture here of the first day that my daughter was with us. We were fostering her. And we got her the night before, and then I had to go to a conference. So I brought her with me, and we sat in the crying room, uh, and we took this picture on her very first day with us. And I didn't know whether or not uh, she was going to be staying with us just for a couple of days or if she was going to be with us for a long time. But I wanted to make sure that she knew that she was a part of this family. So I made sure that she knew that she was, she was joined, that she had a part. I made sure that she knew she was welcomed. 
that we were excited to see her, that we were excited to talk to her and listen to her stories. I made sure that we were authentic with her. I'm not going to share her story with you, but we talk about her story all the time. We don't, we don't hide that stuff. It's, a, it's an open conversation with us. We deny pride with her with her mate right from the very beginning it wasn't as if we had two kids and then one kid over here that it was a family that we were all together we maintain this this confidentiality like i said i'm not sharing her story with you but we 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 have these conversations and we spend time together as as a family because i wanted her to experience just like every one of my kids this idea of what it meant to be a part of our family in fact with all of my kids, I did this thing when they were really young where I would go and lay on the floor of their bed, or the floor of their bedroom until they fell asleep. Now, it seemed like it was a great idea until I was just in excruciating pain from laying on the floor, but I kind of got myself into a, into a rhythm, and, and I did it with all of my kids, both of my boys and my daughter, because we are made for family. We are made for family. And that's the thing that I want you to remember is that no matter what, we are made for family. And that's the last feeling in your notes. Don't forget this. No matter whether you're dealing with an escape room that is a positive thing or an escape room that is a negative thing, whatever escape room you're in, it has to honor the fact that we are a part of a family. And that we don't need to do it on our own. In fact, I want you to hear a story from a friend of mine who has gone through this idea of leaning into his family. Watch this. Well, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, RJ. RJ's been uh, in my growth group and I've uh, got to know him over the last several years, but I want to give you the chance to get to know him. So uh, RJ, why don't you share a little bit about your story? Yes, my name is RJ. Uh... Born and raised in Hawaii, uh, back home, um, you know, back home is surfing. So what we used to do is smoke a little pot, go to the beach. It's almost like meditation, you know, it's a norm back home, you know, and uh, back home it's accepted, you know, my family wise, it is um, not, not necessarily a bad thing, but necessarily a good thing, you know, and uh, moving up here when I had my kid, there we moved up when they're pretty young and uh, I still had that bad habit coming here. And of course I told my wife that, <laughs> I stop. I'm not going to do it no more. And that led to, you know, me lying, deceiving, you know, you know and uh, it has led to really bad problems in my family, in my home life. And, uh, you know, I think about, it was about a month after we moved here is that we looked on the internet and we found Gabe on this little yeah. internet thing. And it's a promotion, I guess. I don't know what it was. Yeah. My wife showed it to me. So when we went to see the service, it was at a low high school. Yeah. You know, so we checked it out and it just felt like home. It felt like the right thing to do. People were nice. Like you said, no perfect people allowed. Yeah. That's where I got baptized. We were the one yep. baptized. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from there, it just grew like a family. You yeah. know, we've been to a couple of growth groups. Um, you know, I've been to... Your, your uh, journey has, has kind of, you've been through both sides of the, of, of the journey mm-hmm. and... and Sometimes you were leaning into your spiritual family. Sometimes you were leaning out of your spiritual family. But what does your life look like when you were leaning away from, from your... When I leaned away from my family, um, you know, I just caught on myself. You know, I don't want to burden anybody with my problems. Um, I just want to do it myself. I want to be alone. Because with that comes, like, there's no responsibility. Yeah. When I'm leaning by my... When I have nobody else um, holding me accountable or... Um, there's no accountability. You yeah. Know? When I'm away, I'm by myself. I don't want to. Uh, but that kind of isolation didn't always lead to, like, it kind of kept spiraling in the same direction, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and the writings are on the wall. But when you're in that situation, it's tunnel vision. You just want to see what you want to see. Yeah. You know. And and leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Leave me alone. I I will fix myself in due time. Yeah. You know. And it always goes like this. Well, give me two weeks. After two weeks, I'll be okay. Yeah. And then that two weeks comes around. I'm like, I'm gonna give myself another two weeks, yeah. and it, and it's, it gets it perpetuates that same cycle. You know, it's a it's a loop. Yeah, a loop that you can't get out of unless you really want to. 
But you have, you, you haven't just stayed there. You've also, there's been times in your journey where you've leaned into your spiritual family. Yes. Uh, and, and into your family. And how has that been different? What does that look like? Well, when you lean into your, uh, your spiritual family, when you have growth groups, um, it's just a lot more, it's a lot more easier, I could say. Um, it's, it just, it's better for my children. It's better for my wife. It's better for me. Um, there's a lot more love when you're with a, a family. Yeah. You know, whether it be my spiritual family or my home family. Yeah. Um, but what's funny is you say it's it's a lot easier, but it's a lot of work to do it too, though, right? Yes. Like, yeah, yeah, it is. Consistency. You have to you have to commit. Yeah. You have to commit. Um, and you have to commit 100. percent Yeah. You know, and and when you commit, you can't fake the funk. You yeah. know, say I'm gonna do this. I'm I'm just gonna show up and do this and not go home and do the homework. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work it's that not way. Worth it. Then it's not worth the effort, right? No, it doesn't. It's it's wasting your time and everybody there. You're just deceiving everybody there because then now they have the perception of oh. He's this way, he's that yeah. way. And it's not, it's, that's, that's not who I want to be. What do you think is the hardest part about doing that, about leaning into your spiritual family? The hardest part? Yeah. Well, the hardest part is you have accountability. You yeah. know, now I'm not, I can't deceive anybody because it's, it's, it's you only can trick somebody so far. You mean like being honest yeah. with what's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Um, and the hardest part is you just don't want to let nobody down. Yeah, you know, and like I said, it's it's a catch twenty two. You don't want to let people down when I'm alone, but when I'm when I'm with people, it's like, well, I don't want to let them down either. Yeah. It's just a cop out. Yeah, it's a cop out. It really is. So how then, because you have you have figured out at times how to overcome that. How yes. how are you overcoming that 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 not wanting to be honest? Uh for me, it's a it's takes like you said, it takes a lot of hard work to be deceitful. It's yeah. a lot more easier to be honest, and it just gives me it gives my heart free. Yeah. It just sets me free. You know, there's no worrying or anxiety of, okay, I got to see this. I got to see that. Well, if you're, to, to, if you're totally truthful, yeah, there ain't no worry. There's no judgment of, of, of anything when I'm with my, right. my spiritual family. And you found some safe places yes, to I do have. that too, yes, right? I with have. people that... CR is one of the places. Celebrate Recovery is one of the places that I've told them that I, have, I probably haven't told my wife. You know, things that I've done in the past before I even met her. Yeah. You know, I did some pretty bad things. You know, I got a lot of scars inside and out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Things that I'm not proud of, but um, it's just good to to release it. You know, because once you release it, it's, like I said, life is a lot easier. It's, it's a lot great. easier being authentic, man. It's, instead of it's a lot of hard work to to be deceitful and to put up a front. And the truth is, man, Jesus forgave you for all that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes. And and you get a clean slate, and mm -hmm. and you get to start over. Well, RJ, man, I'm glad that you are part of my spiritual family Thank and you. It's, it's uh, awesome. thanks for sharing. Thank you, sir. <laughs> it's been awesome.